This is the day that the Lord has made. Oh, now that was weak. Let's try it one more time. This is the day that the Lord has made. Good morning, and welcome to Hertford United Methodist Church. If we have anybody who's visiting this morning, please make sure you see one of the ushers to get a visitor card. Welcome to all those who are watching online. We have just a few announcements for this morning. Our Stephen ministry leaders will meet on Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, during the service today, during the offering, we're also taking an offering for Cross and Key Prison Ministries. This was formerly known as Disciple Bible Outreach. If you've ever taken Disciple Bible Study, what they do is they go into uh, the prisons and they offer this to the inmates and thousands of inmates across the conference have taken part in this. So if you're able to donate to that ministry, there was some information last week in the bulletins. Just mark your envelope or mark your check that you're earmarking it for Cross and Key Ministries. Um, if you got the Wednesday announcement, I asked for sign-ups for the birthdays. That has all been covered as far as I understand. Uh, I want to thank everybody who has signed up for birthdays at Hertford Grammar School. And the sign-up sheet will be on the bulletin board just so you can remember what you signed up for. If you're anything like me, you know, 10 minutes go by, and what did I sign up for? So I want to thank everybody for that. Remember, we're starting Sunday school on September 10th at 9 o'clock, and Ruth and Barbara are going to be teaching Living Fully, Dying Well starting on September 21st. Um, we have a couple other announcements. Stephanie, were you giving? Oh, not today. Oh, yeah, you forgot. <laughs> Stephanie and then um, Patty Bittner have some announcements. Patty, you want to go first since you're down here? Yikes. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just coming to talk about the Hunger Heroes program. That is something that our church has been very involved in and has been so good for the kids. To give you an update of where we stand, they have identified in our community 68 children to be served by the program. The Central School, which is K-2, they've identified 21 students. The Grammar School, which is third, fourth, and fifth, 17 students. The Middle School, sixth, seventh, and eighth, 11 students. The high school, they identify by family. They have 13 families that they've identified, but they're serving 19 students. So it's a total of 68 kids. Two weeks ago, I met with Susan Perry, who is the high school teacher that handles that program. She gets her students involved. Um, they help pack the bags for the students that go to the schools on Friday for the, the three younger schools. The high school is a little bit different. They get a box every other week the boxes are delivered to the homes okay um, when I met with her I, I took a tour of the pantry which was virtually empty which is understandable because they really didn't do it during the summer with the exception there were three cases of chocolate pudding but don't panic because <laughs> the sell by date is February 2024 so they're still good and they won't go to waste um, Susan gave me a list of things so that we could bulk up and thanks to your generous generous generous, generous donations, um, we had accumulated multiple food lion cards. So I've been on two shops so far, but I still have cards to spend. Um, I'm really bad on the thank you notes, so I apologize in advance because I didn't send thank you notes to anyone. But trust me, I will take your food lion card and get the biggest bang for the buck that I can get as far as product, as far as getting enough food for these kids. Um, I have to tell a SpaghettiO story. Uh, that was one of the things on the list. Last year she didn't have it because she had a gentleman that was supplying it. And so that wasn't one of the things that they normally ask for. So after I met with her, I went to the food line and, ooh, SpaghettiO was BOGO. Buy one, get one free. It's like, all right. I had my grocery cart, took every single can of SpaghettiO they had, went up and I was all excited, paid for it, took it out to the car and I thought, well, that wasn't enough to feed the kids. Let me go back in and get a, a rain check. So I went to the desk and I waited, maximum four. I'm like, I'm like, I just bought every can you had on the shelf and I can only get a rain check for four. That's the policy. I'm like, okay. 
hopped in my car, went to <laughs> Food Lion and Eaton, and bought every single SpaghettiO they had, met with Susan Perry. She went to Elizabeth City, bought what they had. <laughs> so it's like, well, we didn't quite get what I was going to get my rain check, but that's the joke between Susan and I. We got our four cans of SpaghettiOs. Okay, so just to give you an update, with your donations so far, we have been able to restock their pantry with 128 cans of SpaghettiOs, 200 snack, uh, fruit snacks, 156 granola bars, 140 fruit cups, 144 packages of crackers, and 172 juice boxes. And I still have money to spend, but when I was in Food Lion, um, the one day, I've done two shops. The cracker lady was restocking. She goes, oh, yeah, we've got a BOGO coming up on September 6th. I'm like, I'll be back. <laughs> so um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I apologize for not sending out thank you cards, but truly your generous donations are appreciated. She said those numbers could increase. Right now we're 68. I wanted to stock the pantry for that first week of school because the kids start tomorrow. She didn't think it would go out the first week. She said probably after Labor Day would be their first packaging and thing, but um, we've got them ready to rock and roll, thanks to your generosity. Thank you. My announcement is also about youth. I just want to remind everybody that um, the Cub Scout Pack 150 will be having a pancake breakfast um, here at church on Saturday morning, um, September 9th. That's the same day as Indian Summer Festival. So um, you can come by here and eat breakfast in the nice, cool fellowship hall before you head downtown for the heat and the humidity of the Indian Summer Festival. So um, I will have tickets available. Um, they're, they're available in the church office now. They're $8 a plate. Uh, that does include Layden's breakfast sausage, so uh, it's a good deal. Um, so please um, help our scout um, pack by purchasing tickets. Thanks. Thank you all. Are there any other announcements this morning? If not, will you please stand for the call to worship? <clears throat> Family of God, as we gather today, Jesus asks us, who do you say that I am? Father, family of God, as we gather today, the Holy Spirit asks us, who do you say that I am? Family of God, as we gather today, God the Father asks us, who do you say that I am? Family of God, as we gather today, the triune God asks us, who do you say that I am? Amen. Our opening hymn is Shout to the Lord, and we'll sing through it two times.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now take this time to pass the peace of Christ to one another. You'll find your prayer lists inside of your bulletins. Um, as Patty did say, school starts tomorrow, so let's pray for parents and teachers and the staff and all of the volunteers. We have a lot in the works from our church that we can that will be helping the schools this year and being the hands and feet of Jesus. So let's keep everything to do with school in prayer. Do we have others to remember this morning? I know we have some people from our congregation traveling um, and on the road, so keep travel mercies in prayer as well. Let us come before God. Lord God, as we gather this morning, we first and foremost come to worship and praise you for all that you are, for all that you do, for sending your son Jesus into this world to atone for our sins and to bring life abundantly to us. We praise you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, which lives inside each and every one who confess you as their God. And so, Lord, this morning we pray for a fresh outpouring of your Spirit that we hear your voice, whether it's through the music, through the fellowship, through the scriptures, through the message, through each other. We pray that we hear your voice and leave here as changed people, that we leave here as people who are more and more like your son, Jesus. You've called each of us to take up our cross daily and to follow you. And so, Lord, help us to see those moments in our lives when you're calling us to serve, when you're calling us to be served, when you're calling us to do something to further your kingdom. So often we stop because we're not sure if something's our business or we don't want to get involved. And yet, Lord, we know that you work in and through us sometimes. And so, Lord, we pray that we have an open spirit to whatever it is you call us to do. We lift up all of the names that are on our prayer list here. We lift up the names of those that we carry on our hearts. We lift up all our, of our unspoken requests, those things that we haven't named out loud, but you know even better than we do. Lord, where there is pain and suffering, we pray for relief. Where there's sickness, we pray for restored health. Where people are transitioning from this life into another, Lord, we pray that you surround them with your peace. Where there's mourning, replace it with comfort, knowing that you're in the midst of all things. We pray for areas around the world this morning that are not experiencing peace. 
whether it's from war or violence, natural disasters, or anything else that could be affecting people's daily lives, your people around the world need you, Lord. And so we hold them up to you, trusting in your goodness and your mercy. We confess, Lord, that we've sinned against you and we've sinned against one another. You've told us that if we confess our sins and believe in Jesus, you'll forgive us. And so we're trusting that you forgive us for the things that we've done and the things that we've left undone. Lead us to a true repentance where we turn away from sin and walk more and, the more, more and more in the ways of your son Jesus who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, our ushers will collect our tithes and our offerings. Again, if you do have an offering for the cross and key ministry, just make sure to mark the check or put it in an envelope so that we know that is separate from the general offering.
Lord, all that we have is yours. You give to us abundantly. And now we give back to you our tithes and our offerings. May they be acceptable and guide us to use them for your glory to bring a slice of your kingdom here on earth. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is in the United Methodist Hymnal and on the screen, number 374, Standing on the Promises. And while you're standing, let us now pr pray together the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. I know this isn't your bulletins, but I'm going to start actually in verse 16. This is when Jesus, after his resurrection, commissions the disciples. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. We may be at the end of our revival sermon series, but just like we revive ourselves every single day by eating breakfast, by doing what we need to do to take care of ourselves, revival is something that has to be part of our everyday spiritual lives as well. So if you remember, the first week of August, goodness, that seems an eternity ago, doesn't it? We reflected, we talked about how is God working in your lives? How has God worked in the past? What ways has God gotten us through life up into this point? We reflected looking at scriptures and examples in scripture, how God worked among the people. And we talked about our own experiences with God. How has God gotten us through different adversities? How has God gotten us through difficult moments? How has God brought us, brought us to this present moment we find ourselves in? When we reflect and see what God has done, it gives us a sense of what God will do in the future and what God continues to do even right now. The second week, we looked and we recommitted. We remembered the vows that we took at our baptism or whenever we joined the church to give our prayers to the church, to, to be present when we can, to share our gifts, whether it's monetary gifts, whether it's our talents, whatever it is, we vowed that we would do that, that we would serve God through the church and be God's witness here in this community, and really wherever we go. I hope you remember prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Remember those in your everyday lives, and each day recommit to all of those things so that the ministry of our church and beyond is what God is truly calling us to do. Then we talked about re-energizing. We all get tired, we all feel burnout, life happens, and there are some days when it's just difficult to get out of bed. And if you're having a day like that, maybe the best thing to do is take a mental health day, take a sick day, take a day to just be and exist. But it doesn't stop there. We do this because we want to re-energize. We want to find that, that, that passion that brought us to God in the first place. Can any of you remember when God was first real to you. Maybe you were a small child and, and you realized that God was real to you. Maybe you were a little bit older in life and you realized that God had a plan for you. I know all of us at the beginning of our faith journeys, we have this excitement about how things should be and how things are going to go. We're excited to be partnering with the creator of the universe. And then, of course, life happens. People don't always agree with us. We see things not the way that they should be. And it tends to burn us out, make us less invigorated. But God calls us to be re-energized. Because our spiritual energy, after all, is not our own. Our, spirit, our spiritual energy comes from God. God gives us the gifts that we need for the time that we need it. And so I pray that we continually seek ways to re-energize, find ways that we can be involved in the church and in the ministries that God has called each and every one of us to do. Find ways to re-energize ourselves and see it's not all humdrum and boring and, and, and tedious. There are victories along the way. And God is a victory enough. Knowing that we've served God and done what we felt was the right thing, God will give us the energy to continue. And so today we're going to talk about re-engaging. In other words, we're going to talk about getting back to the work that God has for us. Now let me tell you what that does not mean. 
We don't want to have a full bulletin with a whole bunch of stuff going on just because that's the way we've always done it before. Remember, those are the words of a dying church. We've always done it that way before. I wasn't going to tell this story, but I probably... I'm going to tell it. I remember a church I was involved with once, and it was the brutal summer, almost almost as hot as what we're going on right with right what we're going on with right now. And and at the time, I was the choir director of this particular church, and the people were telling me, you know, we have to wear our we have to wear our, our robes. We have to have robes, and they have to have the the sash and all the 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 stole and everything on them. It was 96 degrees, and this place did not have air conditioning. I figured if we wear robes, I'm going to lose about 90% of my choir members and have a lot bigger trouble on my hand. So I said, no robes today. Well, they started arguing about it. And finally, I said, if robes are dividing us, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go up on Easter Sunday, the holiest day of the year, right next to the communion elements on the, at the sunrise service, and I'm going to burn these robes. If that's what's going to cause us trouble, because we've always done it that way before. Do you see how we've always done it that way before can actually stifle our energy? Finally, I ended up winning that argument. I was the director. I finally told them, you can wear your robes, but I'm not wearing one. And finally, we got through it, and everything went fine, and the people were like, wow, you made a good call, Tom. I'm like, I do that once in a while. Re-energizing does not mean going back because that's the way we've always done things before. And it doesn't mean that we do things that never bore fruit or things that don't bear fruit anymore. It doesn't mean going back to just having stuff going on so that our bulletins are full. That's not re-energizing. That's just spinning your wheels and not getting anywhere. What re-energizing does mean in a practical sense, in a way that, 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 that you can actually put a vision to this. Look at the church that we have now. What kind of church do we want this to be in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years? I'm guessing all of us want this church to be a beacon of hope, a place where people can come and worship Jesus, a place where the people of Jesus can go out into the community and do what it is that God is calling us to do. If we believe that God still has use for us, and here's a hint, he does. If we believe that God still has use for us, it's going to take all of us to re-engage. Re-engage in the worship that we have each and every week. Re-engage in the mission of this church to make disciples, as Jesus said in the Great Commission, and to re-engage in ministry to the community and beyond. The Great Commission that I read for you today, from Matthew chapter 28, Jesus gives us and tells us, all authority has been given, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. This is our call to engage and to re-engage in the ministries that do that. Now, you've all probably been somewhere where you've experienced something where people were, who were doing a job, maybe they were supposed to be serving you, maybe they were supposed to be doing something, and they're just not engaged in their work. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever experienced something where you just want people to, 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 to get back to what they're supposed to be doing? Oftentimes I feel that at the grocery store, different, different places. You, you run across people who aren't taking their job seriously, and we understand how frustrating that could be. Approximately four years ago, and if anybody from my former church is watching on here, Dan, Cole, Caleb, Austin, you remember this story quite well. We went to a Christian youth camp. It was a three-day Christian youth camp. And you can imagine being surrounded by teenagers 24-7, exactly what kind of great mood I was in at the end of that. It was a good time. They were wonderful teenagers. But you can imagine we were exhausted because teenagers do not sleep. I do not know what they have against sleeping, but they don't sleep. So you're up till 2 and 3 in the morning, and then the alarm clock rings at 6, and, and, and things are going on. 
Well, we were at this camp, and, and when the camp was over, we had about a two-and-a-half-hour drive to get home. And on the way, when you're with three teenage boys, they get hungry. Have you ever seen anybody eat as much as a teenage boy? Good heavens. I don't know where they put it. But they were hungry, and so we decided to stop at, an, at a restaurant that I'm going to call Barbie's, because I don't want to be sued over this. We stopped at Barbie's. And we went and we placed our order. We placed our order for what we wanted. All I wanted was a roast beef sandwich. Some of the boys that were with us, they got some other weird things that were, that were uh, special at the time. And so we ordered, and they said, okay, it'll be just a few minutes. Normally, you know, when you go to a fast food restaurant, you take that word fast, literally. Boy, that was a mistake that day. We, we, we took the word fast, literally. They said, it'll be a few moments while we prepare this. You can go ahead and have a seat, and we'll deliver it to you. So we're sitting down, and after three days of very little sleep, we're all feeling silly, we're all joking around, we're all just kind of having a good time, we're all completely exhausted, and even worse, we're all completely hungry. Five minutes go by, ten minutes go by, fifteen minutes go by, and we still have not as much as gotten our drinks, much less our food. And so we go up, and we're like, did you forget us? Remember, we ordered, oh no, we didn't forget you, your food's just not done yet. Okay. We go and sit down, and I wish I was exaggerating on these times, but I'm not. Another five minutes go by. Another ten minutes go by. Well, Cole, the resident cut-up in our group, he finally goes up to the the counter, and he says, Hey, y'all, if you need help back there, you don't even have to pay me. I'll be glad to come back and help you. They just kind of looked at us weird. He came and sat down, and we waited another five minutes, another ten minutes. We are up to almost 45 minutes now, and we still have not gotten our food. By this time, it must have been the lack of sleep. I'm not sure what was going on in my mind, but I wrote my phone number on a card, and I walked up to them, and I said, is our food almost done? They say, we'll get around to it. I said, all right, here's my phone number. I'm going to go over to Burger Queen. don't want to get sued. I'm going to go over to Burger Queen and get myself a snack. Can you text me when the food is done? I realize in hindsight that was probably not the most polite thing for me to say. Long story short, we waited almost an hour for our fast food. All we wanted at that point, after three days with with, with teenagers who don't sleep and, and, and eating camp food, all we wanted was to sit down and get a meal before we had to go the rest of the way home. We just wanted these people to be engaged and actually re-engaged in their job. We wanted them to take their job seriously. I understand maybe that's not the most important job in the world, but to us hungry travelers that day, we were pretty hungry and it was pretty important to us. We just wanted them to take their job seriously. Now, if I'm talking about a fast food restaurant, we know where, how high that is on, on the importance scale of life. Fast food is, is not really up here on what's the most important thing in life. But if we take this seriously, if we take this faith that we come and profess every Sunday, if we take this faith that we talk about in the community, if we take this faith seriously, do you see how much more seriously our call in the Great Commission is? If we want our fast food workers and everybody else, and I'm not picking on fast food workers, just that group of fast food workers, but if, we're, if we want them to take their job seriously, how much more should we take our job seriously as Christians, as disciples of Jesus? It's called the Great Commission for a reason. Jesus has commissioned each and every one of us to go into all the world and to make disciples. I was doing some research as I was looking up data about, our, about this sermon. And I looked up, it's from the Association of Religious Data Archives. That sounds really official, doesn't it? The Association of Religious Data Archives. They, they, they track churches and membership and, and, and religious things as it comes to do with the census. And in 2020... Uh, this is what, three years ago. But in 2020, the census year... They said there are roughly 38 congregations here in Perquimans County, at least counting the buildings and churches. Of course, there are home groups and things like that that were not counted. 
But they counted 38 congregations, 38 Christian congregations here in Perquimans County. Now, do you know how many people are in the county? Any of you know that? Any guesses? Oh, 20,000, that's a high number. Cut it in half and add 3,000. There's about 13,000 people, give or take, in 2020, unless it grew in the past few years. But in 2020, there were roughly 13,000 people here in Perquimans County. Now, being a preacher, every time I meet somebody and I invite them to church, every single person I met has a home church. Every single person I meet never says a bad word. Every single person I meet volunteers at their church on a regular basis. And almost every single person I meet is a really good liar, too. (laughs) See where I'm going with that? People I meet, they say they have a home church, which might mean that they went into it once or twice. But if you look, we have 13,000 people in Perquimans County, and there are roughly 5,600 53, that's the number I have here, 5,653 that profess that they are involved in a religious community. 5,600 out of 13,000. Okay, I did some of the math for you here. That's 43% of the population belong to a church of some sort. 43% of the population Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that 57% are not connected to to a faith community of any kind. 57%. If I drew a line like right up the middle, or if we just actually cut out the the whole back section, imagine these people up here have a church, those people back there don't. Sorry I'm picking on you, but you sat in the back. It's your own fault. 57% of the people that you pass on a daily basis at Food Lion, 57% of the people that you pass at Walmart, 57% of the people that you walk and pass on the streets have no connection to any faith community at all. More than half of the people you see in the stores, in your neighborhood, have no connection whatsoever to a faith community. Do you think it's time for us to re-engage? Do you think it's time for us to take seriously what Jesus said when he said, go out and make disciples? In our scripture, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. As I said, this is the Great Commission. But I'm afraid today, the church, and I'm not just picking on Hertford, I'm picking on the church in general, the universal church. It seems that the church treats the great commission as the great omission. We're actually leaving out one of the most important things Jesus told, him hims- told, told us himself. When he rose from the dead, the last thing he said to his disciples in the book of Matthew is make disciples. And yet churches become so insulated and it becomes about us. I want the carpet a certain color. I want to have the, right, the same people in the church with me. I want to have what I want. But that's not what Jesus is calling us. He says, go. He never said they're going to come. He said, go and find them. And then we bring them to be part of us. Jesus tells us to go into all nations And yet, if these statistics are correct, and I believe they are because I've looked them up for several counties, 43% is good for those 43%, but for the 57% who have no ties to a faith community whatsoever, we are failing our neighbors. Jesus said go into the world, and the church is barely even going into their own neighborhoods. Now, Maybe it's probably not in my best interest to be so blunt in the first few months at a new, brand new church, but I tell you, we are at a crossroads. Not just Hertford United Methodist, but every church in this area is at a crossroads. We can keep on going the way that we are, but if we do that, we need to remember what Jesus also said in Matthew 25. We're going to be judged on the way that we've treated the least of these. Are we offering hope to our community? 
Are we offering hope to those who are not with us today? Are we offering hope to those who never would dream of coming in these doors? I don't know your faith journey, but there were times I said I would never go into a church again. There have been people in the church who have ruined, uh, well, I shouldn't say they ruined my faith, but but, but they, 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 what's the word I'm looking for here? They, They discouraged me from faith matters. But the one thing I realized is that God is constant. But it also took somebody to tell me that, to tell me that this person who spoke to me in such a mean way, yeah, they might be a Christian, I have to forgive them, but they were also wrong. When I started in church, I was called to be the piano player. I was a little 16-year-old pipsqueak, and I was the the piano player of this one church had to have surgery, and so I I, I filled in for for about three or four months while, while her foot recovered. She sat in that seat back there, so I, if I point at you, just it's trauma, okay? <laughs> the lady who sat in that seat, I played a song that was just a little more upbeat that day, and in no uncertain circumstances, after the service was over, she, was told, she told me I was bound for hell because church was not meant to have a beat to it. I have no doubt this was a wonderful Christian woman. In fact, as the years went on, I did get to know her, and we kind of put bygones as bygones. But remember, what we say matters. What she said that day mattered. I was so angry and so upset as a 16-year-old teenager who had never played in public anywhere that I was not ready to go back the next week, and had it not been for a few members of that church to come up to me and tell me, we appreciate what you're doing, you know, you're, you're, you're doing a wonderful job, and God more so appreciates what you're doing. We had real disciple makers in that church, and they, they brought me back to a sort of faith. Now, we can choose to keep on keeping on, and I think if we look around, we're going to see that we might have five to ten years, or we can take Jesus seriously, and we can be intentional about discipleship making. I hope I didn't step on too many toes there. I hope I didn't make you mad. But remember, God calls us, Jesus calls us to go out and make disciples, I've been a pastor for, what, 13, 14 years now, almost 15, something like that. It grows every time you ask me. I'd have to sit down and do the math. I've been a pastor for the past 27 years now. But in my years, I have seen these statistics over and over again, and I've heard every reason why they're so bleak. Well, just look at the world today, Tom. It just keeps getting worse and worse. People don't care about God anymore. They only care about themselves. That's why our church can't flourish. Well, let me give you a hint. The world is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. We are the agents that are meant to change the world. Did you hear what I said there? We are the agents meant to change the way things are in the world. Tired of all the political bickering and arguing that we see? I didn't even watch the debate the other night because I knew what it would be like. But are we tired of uh, of that discourse among our nation? Well, then be the agents of change. Don't echo it in your everyday conversations. Other excuses I hear are, well, the town isn't the same as it used to be. You know, there were the good old days in this town when, when people took things seriously and people respected one another and people respected God. Guess what? When you were kids, they said that about you too. How many of you ladies wore skirts that showed your ankles? How many of you men had long hair that went down past your earlobe? Okay. You understand what I'm saying here? I know some of us might not have had hair, and I don't want to hurt any, any feelings. You can say that at any point in history that the town is not what it used to be. The town, though, is exactly what it's supposed to be. We are God's agents for change. I hear the excuse, Tom, we're just a small church. People want a church with lots of programs. Well, guess how programs start? They only start when when you and I commit to doing that. I, I looked at our choir today and I said, wow, we're small. But did they complain? Well, a little bit, but not much. 
But were they unfaithful and said, no, we're not going to sing today? We have a smaller number. We usually have a bigger number, but the ones who are here said, I have a gift that I'm called to share in our music ministry. And so they came out, and they did it, and, and aren't they doing it beautifully today, by the way? Oh, Tom, we, we, we just need a church. With, we, we, we just need a pastor with a young family to attract people, and they're going to drag all the youth into the church. My answer to that is always, what's your responsibility? Yes, that is my responsibility to help get people into the church, but at no point does it ever fall directly on the shoulders of the pastor. The pastor is just here to equip you all. Don't give us that much power. Now, don't remember I said that when I want that much power. But don't give us that much power that we determine the future of the church. We're just one person. You, we are all the body of Christ. A pastor with a young family is great, but a pastor with an old family, a single pastor, a wh whatever, can do the same job if we all take our job to make disciples seriously. Oh, pastor, we were doing great until we got Pastor X, and then all the visitors left. All the people who were, were here, they all left. All the ones who were just starting to come under the previous pastor, when the new pastor came, they all left. My question then is, when do they stop becoming visitors and actually become part of the body? You know, I, I, I get what small town life is like. I grew up in a small town, I grew, a lot like Hertford. It is very, very similar. You have to live here about 50 years before you're actually a member of the community. Is that kind of how you feel sometimes? But the way God has designed the church is when you come into these doors, you are a member of the body. You are a member of us. Whether you've done the profession of faith yet or not, you are a member and you belong here. You see, if we're worried about people leaving, why didn't you keep them? At a previous church I served, they talked about their former pastor and how great he was. He said that the pews were packed. We had people coming in, visitors, all the time. And then when he left, the visitors were gone. I said, why didn't you keep them? They wanted me to go out and, and find all these people. I'm like, there's 60, 70 of, of you. There's one of me. You know these people. You formed relationships with them. And because of one pastor, they all left? I, don't, I think there's a little more to the story you're not telling me here. I've heard churches say, we're, we're, we're too old now. Nobody wants to come with, with old people. Or I've had churches say, you know, there's too many young people. Nobody wants to come with all those screaming babies. We're not big enough. We don't have this. We don't have that. Guess who else wasn't big enough? The apostles started with 12. And now, if my, if my math is right, there's like over 1.2 billion Christians in the world that started because of 12 people who took this call seriously. So don't give me the we're too small excuse. Then, of course, there's the if we change the music, or if we change the furniture, or if we change the robes, or the, or the pews, our longtime members are going to leave. If we make this carpet tan tomorrow, or, or Duke blue, which is the only real color of blue. If we, I'm not trying to start a fight, I promise. If, if, if we add padding on the pews, if, if you move the communion table, if, if you move the, church, the piano six inches, have you ever moved the piano six inches in here? You, you know the, 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 the hellfire and brimstone that comes down from moving the piano six inches. Are we that inwardly focused? Are we that inwardly focused that we think this is all about us? Does the location of that piano, if I move it six inches this way, is God still going to be present? I'm pretty sure he will be. Or I also hear the excuse, it's because of X church, whatever X church is, whatever the big church of the day is. They took all our members. Well, they might have, but... If these statistics are right, and I do believe they are, we still have 57% of the population that you pass every day that don't belong anywhere, so let's take them. Do you see where I'm going with all of this? 
We're going to be addressing these thoughts when we start Sunday school, and this is my shameless plug for you all to come out. Hopefully we don't have enough space and have to even have it in here maybe. I don't know. But we're going to be addressing all of this and more in Sunday school beginning on September 10th. But what did you notice about what people say? I call this stuff chin music. Is that an okay word to use up here, chin music? Noise? Excuses? You see, at, at no point in any of those excuses, at least to me, when, and these are real things I have heard, by the way, in my years of pastoring, why we can't do something. At no point did any of these people ever cite Jesus. Well, I don't think Jesus wants us to bring those people into the church. Oh, really? Well, I, 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 I don't think Jesus wants us changing the carpet. Well, I don't think Jesus wants us to go out and find the 57% that don't have a church. If you're going to have excuses, at least cite Jesus for it. At no point do these excuses ever cite Jesus. And unless Jesus is at the center of what we do, it's bound to fail. Jesus called us to go into the world and make disciples. Now, since the beginning of July, I tell you, we have what it takes to start doing that in an even more effective manner here. I've met with our, our, our ministry leaders, our Stephen ministry, our choir, our nurture committee, our outreach worship, school ministry teams, our small groups. I'm sure I'm forgetting a bunch of things up here. I've met with them all, and they're all ready to start and even push forward into doing new things. Maybe you have some ideas. Maybe you have some ideas on how we can, we can build this church and really go out into the community and make disciples. Our facilities are second to none. Don't we have one of the most beautiful churches with some of the most beautiful education wings? We have space. Our congregation is second to none. It's just time now that we re-engage what God has already given us. I don't know God's exact call for this church, but I know together we can discern it. Maybe we are a church that will have an older population because we do live where there are retirement communities, and that's fine. Maybe that's our calling. Maybe our calling is to reach the people in the neighborhoods around us, and maybe not everybody will look like us. Or maybe our call is to reach out into the county, the more rural areas. Maybe all of this is our call. We can discern it together. In the kingdom of God, we are all participants, not observers. Jesus tells us, go and make disciples of all nations. Why do we do this thing called church? It was never about us to begin with. It was never about me. It was never about you. It's always been about Jesus and making disciples for him. So we can make our building as pretty as we want it. We can make sure the messages and the pastor says only those things we want to hear. We can even grow in our own personal devotion. But are we carrying out the Great Commission? I pray that you're going to join me in the things to come in this church. And if you have ideas, please share them with me. But it's time that we re-engage in our ministries or engage in new ministries in order to make disciples. Now, I promise you this will not be an easy road, but you're not alone. Jesus tells us, I am with you always to the end of the age. So as we go and make disciples, let us remember Jesus is calling us and Jesus is with us. Amen. Our closing hymn is one we sang a few weeks ago, but I think it's a great one to end a revival sermon series with. Number 593, Here I Am, Lord, Will You Please Stand?
And now as we go from this place, let us remember the Great Commission to go therefore into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen.